The following is a presentation of the Four Center podcast feed. From the center of the galaxy, this is the Four Center podcast feed, and this particular episode is Cues of the Force, Quotidian of the Force. No, that's just a fun word to say. It's Questions of the Force. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw. I'm Ken Napsock. Happy to be here answering questions or answering anything with a cue. Just happy to be here. I'm just happy to be here. Happy to be on the team. <laughs> happy to be here answering uh, some cues with some A's. Uh, we have several A's to get through, and one of them is our intro from Audible. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. We've been doing this for a while, so I bet it's really really over 180,000 titles to choose from. Mm-hmm. But this week we are recommending, uh, in honor of the Galactic Star Cruiser, a book that features it, and in my personal opinion, features it very well. It's one of my very favorite Star Wars books, The Princess and the Scoundrel by Beth Revis. If you haven't checked it out, check it out on us. You can download your free audiobook today by going to audibletrial.com slash center. One more time, that's audibletrial.com slash center for a free audiobook. One A down, several to go. We're on to our Ask segment, Ken. That's right. We're going to ask a few things here. First of all, we're going to ask you to consider hanging out with us here Saturday. Uh, <laughs> if you're listening at the time of this original broadcast in uh, the week of uh, uh, May 22nd of 2023. Some of you might be listening seven years from now. I don't know. We have a live show at 2 p.m. Pacific, a live Q&A. Uh, we're going to be talking Star Wars visions, news, Indiana Jones, taking your questions. A lot of fun. Uh, me, special guests, uh, Joseph, uh, you might, we'll be honest, you might be there, you might not be there. You might have to head out of town. So it's an adventure. It's a mystery. We're going to ask you to, to check out uh, hang uh, that this Saturday at 2 p.m. Pacific on our YouTube channel. Also, uh, looking at our Patreon page, patreon.com slash Force Center. We'd love for you to consider checking that out and supporting us. Help us reach our new goal. If we reach 2200 a month, we'll do another ranked live stream exclusive for our patrons and then release that to the public later. We did our favorite scenes of the sequel trilogy uh, last time out. So that is one of the things we're doing. Also, because of what you've uh, made possible, uh, we are going to have a Jedi Beat the YouTube edition with Jennifer Landa working on that right now as we speak. Uh, that's going to premiere Monday, July 17th. Uh, Five-week run on that show. Uh, we're excited to get to that as well. So there you go, Joseph. That's the asks. <laughs> well done and uh, pronounced exactly as Bosk would ask. <laughs> Uh, yes, and I very, very much hope to be there for the live Q&A. It has become one of my favorite things that we do. I really love the back and forth with people in chat. So uh, crossing uh, everything uh, physically available to me yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that I will be there. There's some uh, family stuff that might uh, be in interruption, but I'm going to try to be there. And if not, the show will go on because mm-hmm. Ken and I are like old vaudevillians. The show yeah. will go on. <laughs> yes, yes. Indeed. <laughs> so, yeah, get get your uh, stripy jacket and your straw hat and your cane ready. <laughs> I just think, I, I just, sorry, this is total. I like, I'm like, we do do that. And there's been times where you and I both have been on air, live or otherwise, where maybe we even shouldn't because we're just, we just work. <laughs> <You know? laughs> My fiance was being taken away to the ER during one live show. And I was like, nope, uh, Paul McCartney goes in the studio. Uh, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. Uh, but you're right. And we're happy. And I truly love hanging out with all of you on the live shows. Yep. Uh, 100% uh, <laughs> agree with all that. So <laughs> we are going to dive into our cues. Very excited for this. Uh, our first, uh, we, first we're going to do two of uh, from patrons on Patreon. And then after the break, uh, we are going to be diving into a question from Twitter and a great power of the light side segment. Um, all right, here we go, Ken. Uh, first, uh, Robert Meadows. Uh, Robert says, greetings all. In seasons one and two of The Mandalorian, Gideon had a mustache. In season three, Gideon did not have a mustache, and neither did the clone we saw. My question is, could the Gideon that died in season three be a clone? Could the real mustache-wearing Gideon still be alive? 
Do you even want to see more Gideon, or should the show move on without him? Love to hear your thoughts on the mustache theory. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> this is great. I have. I, I think I've seen glimmers of this. I have no idea if, like, if I looked up, you know, Star Wars hashtag mustache theory. <laughs> <laughs> Might be something else. This, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I have so many edited thoughts <laughs> that I am not sharing right now. Uh you're right. Uh, don't don't Google mustache theory, kids. Yeah. Um mm. anyway. Have you is this is this new to you or have you heard discussion of is that the real Gideon who died? He didn't have a mustache. Yeah, saw this, saw this probably the next morning. And uh, I'll say, I'll start here. And Robert, this is a wonderful question. I love Joseph's interpretation of your question even more than, than the question itself. I love that really. That was a, he did not have a mustache. Um, <laughs> I usually keep walking past these theories. I really do. I, uh, they're interesting. Uh, they're, they're, they're sometimes fun. I sometimes I just drives, I, it, it, it drives me wild how you all come up with these sometimes. Or I'm like, I just don't think like this. And I love a good theory, both in Star Wars and in life. I often don't believe any of them. Um, but I'll say this before I pass the talking hammer back to you. It, it, it comes off just purposeful enough to make me stop and stare into the window of conspiracy theories. The clone, the mustache on him there. No, yeah, it was clear in the design of the character the first two seasons. It's not here. There's a lot of fun to be had with it. But I'll say that, Joseph, from the stuff. It did make me go, hmm, okay, I'm listening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I get it because it is a it is a physical change mm -hmm. in Gideon. I think part of it for me with, with Star Wars theories like the mustache theory is – I don't know how often Star Wars is um, trying to build uh, build in sneaky clues. Like that's an interesting question to me to to think through. I don't, I don't know that I have the answer, but like some of the most famous you know Star Wars reveals have been quite clear. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, not set up with great tricksy. We hid something in the background. Um, yeah. Uh, it, it, the original trilogy came out in an entirely different generation, an entirely different atmosphere. I feel like if uh, a new hope came out now, exactly as it is, everyone would walk out the theater going, yeah, Darth Vader's his dad. Yeah. I remember mm -hmm. that scene where, you know, yes. Owen was like, uh, that um, he's got too much of his father in him. And then when mm -hmm. Luke asks Obi-Wan what happened to his dad, Obi-Wan does the little shifty eyes mm -hmm. in, 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 a, in modern view, there's mm -hmm. that's being, absolutely battered over the head with the talking hammer. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that was even not, Lucas didn't know it at the time, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, even, and then you go to Empire and they like, um, no, there is another, like, there, there, there aren't, aren't that many options. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like, yeah. Rando, Chewie, Leia, like, uh, yeah. who, who got left, you know? Uh, yeah. General Riking, is, does he have the force? What, you know? Yeah, so true. Um in we're in modern storytelling, and I think I think Filoni plays with audience expectations at conventions, mm -hmm. like things mm -hmm. like you know changing T-shirts to Ahsoka lives. Um, I, I think, uh, but like even with like Ahsoka's connection to Mortis, like there's nothing like ooh, it's buried in the background. She's yeah. followed everywhere by a bird that's associated with the daughter from mortis it's mm -hmm. not you know ooh, i caught something in the background how do you feel about that just about the the style of storytelling of mm -hmm. whether star wars is in, in different we have so many different storytellers yeah. now but do you feel like any of them are like trying to layer in a deep secret in the background or did you notice the missing mustache kind of thing yeah i i, I did not notice it uh i mean well i'll take it back I, I did notice it but i didn't think anything of it uh just like i don't know maybe Giancarlo Esposito was like not this year <laughs> you know, <laughs> I got to shoot something else. Yeah, who knows? Um, but you, you know what you brought up is an interesting side discussion here that that spills out of Robert's question. Of I, I absolutely think you're right. How we view things has clearly changed. There's a lot of factors, some good, some bad. And I, I, I'll admit, even even on Spotlight Star Wars episodes back in 2015 and 2016, I was excited that a little bit of you know, for lack of a, a really lack of a better term, that mystery box thing had shown up, and and that one fateful TED talk JJ Abrams gave mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, 
uh, put to shadow a lot of his his career and creative choices. Um, I, th- I thought it was great that some some speculation had come to Star Wars. I really did, which is why I needed to uh, have uh, the speculate responsibility lesson hit me in 2017. I, I, I spent, you know, obviously a lot of time not just watching but digging into the Game of Thrones world as as a podcaster as well. And Cashly Stock, Cashly Talk is still on a break, folks, uh, but we're going to be back. And even that, that that comes out of even a show of like Lost with theories and who's going to sit on the throne and all this kind of stuff. There was one a week where all of us in season six, all of us spent almost every hour of that week convinced and wondering about a shadow that we all thought was Serial Pharrell, the character from season one that, that well, Clearly died, but because we didn't see it, there was hope, which I get as a Stannis fan. <laughs> and then it was a freeze frame. You have uh, 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 Val from uh, Andor. Uh, you know, the waif is chasing Arya, and there was a freeze frame. Oh, my God, that is that is Sirius puffy kind of curly hair. It's his shape. It's the shadow. He's going to come save her. Oh, my God. It was a millisecond of a shadow. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't think a lot of these shows are doing that. Now, MCU layers in things in, in course and, and something appears, you know, Pe- Project Pegasus appears on a box in Iron Man 2 and it shows up here. Yeah, but even that is not what I consider to this level what you're saying. So the audience expectations have changed. But Joseph, I just wonder if there is merit for that, if there's ever been merit for that other than just our own imaginations running wild. Yeah, I mean, I just think, much like Robert's question, which we will actually get to, Robert, is it's yeah. fun. And it's, it, fun. it's we always talk about the playground conversations and the bar conversations, and now they're the podcast and streaming conversations. Or just you, you dig into something you love and you turn it around, you hold it up to light and turn it around every which way. And for me, it's natural that, like, hey, did you do you think this might happen? Is fun. I love it. Mm. I just think that sometimes uh, th- that we can pull back and, and go like, is that it really analyze? Do we think this is the kind of story that is asking us to ask those questions? Mm-hmm. I had disagreements in person uh, at, at conventions in bars mm-hmm. uh, with friends that I love about, uh, about the force awakens. Um, mm-hmm. If, mm-hmm. if nobody's ever looked up JJ Abrams comments about the mystery box, it was, as Ken was saying, it was a TED talk and it was a topic that was suggested to him by a friend mm. and it was not meant to be. This is my zeitgeist. This is who I am. This is mm-hmm. my defining perspective. Uh, but that and lens flare ha- have been attached mm-hmm. to him forever. Right. I just, I, I remember having specific disagreements with people about the shot in The Force Awakens where, uh, Maz says to Han, who's the girl? And then we cut to Ray and we don't get to hear the answer. And I had people who thought like, see, Han secretly knows who she really is. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I was just like, that's not what I felt at all. I didn't, I didn't, I felt like, yes, we do want to know her origins. Is she connected with anybody? But I felt like the question of who is the girl is the lightsaber is calling to her. The force is calling to her. That's the answer in this mm-hmm. film is the way I felt. And I'm sure to this day, even listeners uh, might disagree with me. And I is always have the utmost respect to that, but I just didn't feel like mystery box was the intent. I, I really agree with you. And yeah, Robert, we will get to your question. Uh, it, <laughs> it is all fun. Cause I had fun, you know, that the look, it's not like force Awakens doesn't ask you, Hey, who's raised parents or, you know, who's Snoke and what's the relationship to Kylo Ren and Luke. And, and the, yes, that stuff's there, but it's like, remember again, we spent a lot of time and we maybe even do who I can't remember. Maybe we discussed it here, but just yeah, definitely in the other show I was on at the time. Like, you know, Han's look, uh, Harrison Ford gives a read to Ray when, when, when she says, Ooh, I know there's so much green in the galaxy. And he, and, and, and we hours were spent on that look as if they said, all right, Harrison, you've got to look over to her in a way that uh, tips off that, you know, her origins, right? Yeah. It, 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 Harrison be like, I don't care about that. Uh, and, and it's just to read as an actor in a scene. And, and, and that's where the fun spills out into the speculative responsibility thing here. And I just, mm-hmm. I, at that point stopped, you know, the big, with star Wars, even before the last Jedi for me was battlefront two, where it was suddenly just assumed that Iden Versio uh, uh, and Del Miko were Ray's parents. <laughs> and that people involved with the game, Mitch Dwyer and all those folks were like, what? No, what? what are you talking about? No. Why would we do what? <laughs> no. And that's one of the times I remember 
All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull back on that stuff too because I thought, oh sure, that, that it's all connected, right? And again, everyone goes to the Kathleen Kennedy uh, uh, April 2014. You know, it's all connected. I get it. I get it. I get mm-hmm. it. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. So, anyways, uh, all that to say, I, it, it 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 it's it's a fascinating study. Yeah, and I think for me, like I said, it's fun, and, and I can't wait to actually talk about Robert's question. <laughs> just a but great question. I just don't like it when it overshadows the just the story that is being told in front of you now it's what the mcu gets accused of which i don't entirely agree with i think every mcu movie uh with with maybe some wobbles here and there tells its own story and then as a part of the tradition of the serialized storytelling it's adapting they tease the next story in the credits yeah 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 but it's it's telling a story and i want us i want us to engage with the story that's there now and like the Han Solo look thing to me it was it, it was it's a, such a powerful moment of Han's been there Han knows what it's like to yeah. dream about seeing the galaxy uh you know the Solo movie hadn't come out yet and it made it that made it even more clear but you can always already know that about Han mm-hmm. you can already know that he's met a bunch of punk kids like Luke Skywalker when he first met him who's never been off world yeah. and it's just that look of like Oh, that's who this girl is. Mm-hmm. This poor thing's never seen anything. That's who she is. And I feel for her. Yeah. It was a ton of information about who she is mm-hmm. and about who Han is and about the way that Han sees her truth. And it, I don't want to miss all those rich things because I think it's a, a clue in a scavenger hunt. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and even with the, the, you mentioned the MCU thing. I said, again, I, I just don't, think it's doing it as as much as people even want it to be but anyway, yeah, yeah. I, I just had i'd had experience at one of these places of work and working. I, I won't say any names and, and definitely won't uh, spoil anything um related to characters but someone said hey i want to do a, a video i have a theory that blank character becomes princess leia's guardian and I, i'm new here and I, I couldn't say out loud in the meeting what the <laughs> hell are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to, because then it just gets wild. It just gets wild. Some of the ideas, and it's like, what? Are, what do you even? Why? And that's why we always go to the question of why. Uh, why? Why would you think that? Uh, and I want. And if you have a good answer for it, then I'm interested. Mm-hmm. Then I'm interested. Anyways, Robert, this is none of you. You've had. You've suggested a wonderful, uh, fun topic, and we're going to dive in. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes the wild things turn out uh i yes jokingly many people jokingly myself included was like well ray did do that poking stabbing forward lightsaber movement uh, in force awakens maybe she's related to palpatine uh the the my friends over at star wars minute pulled that clip after rise of skywalker because jennifer and i were on there joking about like well she's a palpatine she does the stab move like yeah 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 so you know what sometimes the wild guesses do pan out so Mm -hmm. let's get back to robert's question um so uh, here are my thoughts about mm-hmm. um, the mustache in particular. Um, I'm not I, I'm not on board right now with the mustache theory that that was a clone who died because I don't. My interpretation of the the scene is that the clones don't quite work yet. Mm-hmm. That it's a story of of hubris that he is trying to do something unnatural and that he's getting closer. Uh, I think that's a part of the reason that we spend so much time with Pershing where he's like, I'm so close to making it work to, you know, and I think in that context, I think he means combine DNA. So it is an exact clone of Gideon. And yet I can use Grogu's midichlorians to replicate this connection to the force without it's, Hey, it's Gideon, except he has green ears, <laughs> the long green <laughs> Grogu ears. Yeah. Uh, I think that's what Pershing was close to accomplishing mm-hmm. and it didn't quite work yet. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't think that clone that fought in the armor uh, or that clone, I don't think the Gideon that fought in the armor was a clone because it, my headcanon is they didn't quite work yet. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you on that. Um, and, and that's part of what his frustration was, right? When, when you, 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 you smashed that, you took, you, you took, you snuffed out their life. He was really upset about that. Uh, and yeah, not to, to, to be the boring conspiracy smasher again, but I think his end consumed by, you know, essentially the fires of Mandalore itself, so to speak. I, I think that was the end that I needed. It was the end for that character and his obsession with it. And, and, and 
And I'm not even saying this, this, when we talk themes, I'm not saying every second it builds towards this theme. It's just how you interpret some of these stories. But I look at his, his story, his obsession with Mandalore, his obsession with power, and even within his own Imperial remnant is all about himself to the point where he's going to give him, give his power to himself. And Mm -hmm. on the other side, you have, you have, you know, these tribes of Mandalore coming together for each other. That's, that's the stakes and that's what's going on. And therefore he being, uh, consumed by the fires of his, his own uh, his own desires for self there are what it's about and, and 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 why I think that in the end is the answer but I always leave Joseph two percent window of opportunity for mustache Gideon to come back <laughs> that's right uh if the the stab uh can the mm-hmm. lightsaber stab can come true then this could come through true as well uh I really agree with you I also feel like um while I would love to see more Gideon, uh, I feel like his arc, his arc feels complete. It, it doesn't yeah. feel like unresolved. Um, it, it did feel a little unresolved in season two. So I was like, eh, I hope he comes back. But I feel like what has been finally fully revealed, and I think was really well set up throughout the Mandalorian, is that Gideon isn't just another uh uh, former IBS, uh, uh, IBS. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, that's a different thing. Uh, a former Imperial officer. Um, yeah. That uh, ISB officer, not IBS. Uh, maybe that's why I had to shave uh, the mustache. Maybe. It was yeah. somehow helping his bowel syndrome. <laughs> uh, <laughs> ISB uh, officer, mm-hmm. or, you know, one of the Imperials in the New Remnant. He was obsessed with Mandalore. Um, yeah. And that specific awful perspective that has happened in the real world of uh i am not from this culture but i want to conquer it and prove that i'm better in it while also stealing everything about it uh Mm -hmm. that was i think the most interesting thing to me about gideon and i feel like this is a fitting end of you know he he burned up in his flames of hate while trying to take their culture from them and they won and they took their culture back yeah uh so that makes me feel like that's the end of his arc and he's and he was a powerful player and he's Mm -hmm. off the board uh going forward with the 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 you know resurgent empire Mm -hmm. slash baby first order that we're seeing the beginnings of yeah no absolutely i i I agree with you and in terms of ends i mean that's that's quite an end A, a, a star cruiser you know crashing into a planet and things exploded and you, you you and your armor and you're gone i mean you know if you're looking for big send-offs that's quite quite the way uh and i'm with you as the show rolls more into the galaxy at large i think it's time to discover new villains we got the big one kind of hanging over it all and i'll say this i would have loved some scenes with thrawn and gideon facing off that would have been mm-hmm. number one the slowest pace conversation in all of star wars history. <laughs> <laughs> but it would have been interesting and and so maybe that's part of my two percent being open there. Sure, sure, let's do it here. Um, but I'd love to see more villains as the show rolls on into more of the you know perhaps uh, Rangers of the New Republic uh, Mandalorian kind of vibe that seems to be happening, and and including in the list of new villains, love to meet are, are any of those within the New Republic working to thwart growth and change, which I imagine mm-hmm. is uh, still going on, and we of course saw a little bit of that in this season as well. So that'd be kind of fun. Yeah, no, absolutely. I would I would love to see all that. And I wouldn't be opposed to seeing more Gideon in flashbacks. Uh I, I would have mm-hmm. taken a little more Gideon in the in the show. I think he is his appearances were were minimal and I think this picture of who he was 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 clear, but I would have I would have taken diving in just a little mm-hmm. deeper, even seeing a flashback of him, you know, truly, truly being in charge of uh, the night of a thousand tears of seeing a flashback. Not that Star Wars is lousy with flashbacks uh, all the time, but mm-hmm. I just think a, a lot of his, his obsession with Mandalore and his different his confrontation with Bo-Katan, all that stuff is fascinating to me, and I wouldn't mind seeing those in other places at, at some point. But I'm fine with him being burned alive and, and done now. <laughs> yeah, I'm with the I'm with you as well. Final thought then, Ken, is if we are are, are in the team of our mustache theory is. He shaved it. <laughs> Why did Gideon shave his mustache, or was it uh, forcibly removed by New Republic authorities? Uh, it, uh, well, actually, you know what? I didn't think about that. I, I don't think necessarily. You know, um, they're gonna you, you know force you to shave, but that's possible. 
it's possible some kind of uh, inmate treatment thing going on there. But I've also taken it, uh, you know, the clones aren't working. The program's been uh, going on for a bit. And maybe they were like, you know what, sir? We hate it. We're sorry for saying it. Your facial hair might be tripping this up a little bit. Could you maybe go, oh, okay, I'll go clean shave. And yeah, I want to get this right. Um, and, and and maybe that's part of it as well. This this batch had to be like, it, it, it was the hairless model. I love that. I've been learning a little bit more about 3D printing uh, and that there are certain parts that uh, everything's going along great. And then this part is hard for the printer and it uh, spaghettifies and the the, mm-hmm. the plastic just falls everywhere. I love the idea. Like these clones are going great until they get to the mustache and then just <laughs> <they> <laughs> fall apart. <laughs> PC load air. Yeah. Yeah. PC load air on mm-hmm. the print Gideon. I also do like the idea that he had some like, you know, a uh, nanobite the secret hair weapon. And they're like, well, we're just going to have to shave everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Great question, Robert. Uh, uh, Thank you for letting us go on a massive, massive tangent on your uh, fun and thoughtful uh, question. This was a a great way to re-examine Gideon. And, and I I do actually do, I really do think Ken that this one is, um, I don't think that that was a clone, but that mustache being different is substantial enough of a thing that I think this one is a reasonable, reasonable one to question. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. I agree with that. All right. We're going to move on to our second question from patrons on Patreon. This one comes to us from Antonio Mendiola. Uh, Antonio says, my question to you both, considering the fact that uh, Dave Filoni uh, is or soon will be working on his New Republic versus the Imperial Remnant film and the fact that Ahsoka calls Thrawn the heir to the Empire in her series trailer, I wondered if you two were planning on rereading the original Thrawn trilogy. I know Joseph has been saying lately that he'd like to reread them because of the Ahsoka trailer, but I don't know if he's serious or not. I've never read any of the old EU, now Legends novels, but I own quite a few. I'd love to read the Thrawn trilogy despite some of the details I've heard not aligning with my Star Wars preferences. And if you do reread this trilogy, would you consider doing a one-shot episode on your general modern feelings on the trilogy as a whole? Either way, thanks for all you do. Thank you for this great question. Ken, I'll start here. Um, I'm not joking. I really, really do. I've wanted for years to reread those novels because there are a couple things that I've talked about that that bumped for me when I was a, a teen <laughs> mm-hmm. reading these. Uh, but I so deeply respect how much they mean to fans. And, and I have friends who are like, this was my gateway. This is peak Star Wars to me. And I want to read it through those eyes and, and read it like this is somebody's first Star Wars and see what there is there for me to appreciate. I felt that way for many years. Mm-hmm. With everything that's brewing in the in the Filoni New Republic storytelling, I feel like whatever year that Filoni movie comes out, mm-hmm. at least before then, I want to read them. Where do you go with this, Ken? I do plan on reading the comic adaptation, which I, I think I had said uh, on an episode recently. I picked them up. I have all of them. I picked them up at my uh, my old comic shop in Northridge about four or five years ago. Uh, mm-hmm. They were on sale, the whole batch. And I do own um, I do own the novels, but I got to be honest, I'd have to go dig dig into the shed and find all of them. I have one on uh, Air of the Empire and Paperback, and the other Last Command and uh, Dark Force Rising. I have uh, in hardback, but I don't even know where I could find them. So I do plan on that. It'd just be a little quicker for me to read the comics right now because I just want to re-experience the story and 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 see things I missed. Maybe might not be as detailed as the books, of course, um, but I think I do want to just kind of go back. It it wouldn't be a bad idea. You know, to get a feel for it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is my my biggest question for rereading them is um I, I when they started putting out the um those new uh, paperbacks of Legends books, mm-hmm. um, they sent me the first three. Um in, in Heir to the Empire is one of them. Uh, I don't have the others in that edition, but a part of me just really, really wants to um reread my paperbacks from the, or um hardcovers yeah, yeah, right, from right. the 90s uh which in last last summer my wife and I got everything moved from our Minneapolis storage space to our new Los Angeles story space mm-hmm. it had so somewhere within 50 boxes yeah right <laughs> uh 15 of which are back breaking uh book boxes of Don't 60 work. pounds or my original hardbacks so I was like do I dig do I dig to find my copies and see if I, I don't think I jotted any notes, but who knows? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's a note to a girl I liked in high school that I stuck in those pages. I don't know. 
<laughs> I have I have those as well. I have one from the sixth grade. Uh, <laughs> uh, Shelley, you never answered. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. And I, look, I you know I, I, a lot of places to go with this here. I do suggest people read these books for themselves, uh, or uh, and take a look at some of the the bigger novels in the, in the air overall. Judge for yourself. Uh, I think I always try to address address uh, address this. I want to I always want to continue to address it. I can be a little snarky in the EU. I can be a little down on it. Um, and I don't want that to be, you know, hypocritical to what we preach around here. Uh, if you are, you know, a, 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 a young woman in the nineties, who's a big Star Wars fan and Mar Jade was really one of your only choices outside of Leia Mothma, you know, I'm, that's, that's the right perspective on Mara Jade, not mine. Yours, yours is the right way. I think if you're a scoundrel and you looked up to Talon Card, then, you know, that, that's. <laughs> right as well. I I always just want to be clear. It's even less the stories, it's the stuff around it. I, I think that mid '90s vibe doesn't jive with me completely. I, when you think of mid '90s Star Wars, I think of buff Chewie with a flat top, and mm -hmm. it, it's very much of its time um, and, and not um, more universal. But also, there's just a vibe to that, and some of the you know I'll just say it. There's just some of the people around that liking that kind of Star Wars that exemplify holding on to things for me who are a little bit more challenging. I was discussing this with our friend, Brian Ward, who has faced these, uh, um, well, say it mostly gentlemen face to face at conventions over the years selling art who, uh, I don't know. There's just a vibe about it. That is more than the EU content. It's, it's that vibe that keeps me away from it, but that's not necessarily the, 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 the whole picture there. So, uh, even though, uh, I haven't taken that deep dive in a while, um, there's a lot to enjoy it and, and, and take it in for yourself is what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I really agree with that. I, I think, especially with Mar J, there are really some representation issues. Um, you know, mm -hmm. if, if you're an, an old haunted wizard <laughs> and Jorah Sabanth is your guy, I, I understand. I'm getting to be an old haunted wizard myself. <laughs> um, I think another thing that I'm really fascinated to re-experience is uh, I read the novelization of the original trilogy when I was, you know, mm -hmm. young. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I didn't read the Han Solo or the Lando books. So a part of me reading these books was Star Wars is back. Yeah. But there was a real question of like, but does it work on the page when you can't see the lightsabers, when you can't hear the buzz, when there's no John Williams and like, uh, it, it, you know, I, I didn't have the words for it or the perspective for it then, but the movies are whiz bang adventures in, in a book can only be a whiz bang adventure up to a point. The strength of a book is to, slow down and go inside each character's head. Mm. And now I love the publishing side of Star Wars. So the one obstacle is entirely removed and will be an entirely different experience for me reading these again. Right. Yeah. No, yeah, no, there, there was a little bit different vibe even back then reading the books, you know, you could only go so far, but it was, a, and, and, and look, Filoni is, uh, and, and speaking of conspiracy theories, we have not taken that deep dive into whether that's going to be the title of his movie or not, Air of the Empire, mm. to be honest. At this point, I, uh, whatever, I don't care. <laughs> I just, I, yeah, I, the, the, the title is not make or break for me. Yeah. Um, he's, he's very right in how he's talking about it and how, what those meant. That's all that, the, the Walden book factor, seeing him on the shelves mm -hmm. and beating Walden, that's a real thing. And, and I think that's part of why I want to re revisit the stories and see it, um, see it again. Cause it's been a long time, a long time. Yeah. And I think, you know, when, when we talk about being a positive pod, podcast, we always want that to be that we, we talk about things in a way that is welcoming to everyone. And when something isn't for us, that we're, you know, polite and open about it. And I mm -hmm. think that no matter what, there will always be some things in the this original Tr Thrawn trilogy that are not entirely for me. I think mm -hmm. that Timothy Zahn has a, a slightly more science fiction angle to Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And I am so about the space fantasy in the, in the mythic that I think I'll always bump a little bit. Yeah. But to the end uh, of Antonio's questions of whether we would do uh, uh, any sort of coverage on it, um, I would love to, uh, is, is uh, listeners mm -hmm. will know from our uh, comically far behind uh, recommendations of which audiobook to check out, it took us forever to get to Kenobi. It took us forever to get to Battle Scars. So we're almost an entire face behind. Yeah. Yeah. We are. <laughs> on the High Republic. Um so I really, really, really want to. Um and it is just really a matter of time and where are we at uh at the point that we 
get a chance to reread them. Uh, in co- it would be even fun if you read the comic books and I read the books and yeah. <laughs> compare and contrast. That'd be a fun episode. Yeah. How do you feel about it, Ken? I'd love no, I'd love to and, and and approach it in a good way. I mean, how many times even on the Clone Wars report? Um, where we, you know, we revisited episodes of characters. Uh, I said this story before, but I, I've to Steven Stanton's face uh, said, I don't like Niebuhr Gascon. He's my least favorite Star Wars character. That's no longer true. That's no longer true. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I love the, the D squad arc. And that comes from looking at things a little differently and, and um, time. And so I'm definitely interested. And, 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 you know, you loved your experience reading that Kenobi book, right? Um, mm-hmm. Miller. The Darth Plagueis novel by James Lucino is amazing. It, 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 it would need a little bit of massaging to be canon. Um, but I still, that's still one of my favorite reads. I really like that book. So uh, there's quality out there. So talking about the, uh, the Thrawn trilogy after, after all these years would be, would be a valuable experience. Yeah, I would love to do it, and uh, time will tell. Just like exactly what the Filoni New Republic film is, mm-hmm. uh, what maybe it's called Dark Side Rising. Who knows? Uh, the Last Command. Maybe it's the end of the saga. Mm-hmm. Who knows? We will find out, and uh, I will definitely, in some form or fashion, I might join Ken in the comic books, but I really want to reread the Thrawn trilogy. I have nothing but excitement for it and happiness uh, for the fans who this these these books mean so much to them and they're going to be celebrated and uh and uh, highlighted underlined in the ahsoka trailer can't wait for it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with one more cue and a power of the force back in the moment And we are back. We are going to take a question from Twitter. This comes to us from Chris Lamb. Chris Lamb says, now that we have three new movies and music is so integral to Star Wars, I have a few questions. One, with Williams most likely not coming back, are there any composers you'd be interested in joining this galaxy? And which composers would you choose to see score each film? Would you want a consistent composer that dictates the new tone for the films like Williams did or hire based on the project? Personally, I think since Star Wars has become so diverse in its stories that the scores should reflect individual stories. I'd love to see what rock star Hans Zimmer could bring to this galaxy. For each film, uh, I think uh, Ramon... Uh, Ken, what is the proper pronunciation of this? Ramin Jawadi. Yeah, Ramin Jawadi. Ramin Jawadi. Give, Ramin Jawadi. About 98% of my uh, American tongue uh, accurate, but I have, yeah, I've seen him in concert <laughs> a few times and his name is said, so Ramin Jawadi. Ramin Jawadi. So, uh, yes, Chris Lamb says, reach film. I would think Ramin Jawadi would be perfect for Dawn of the Jedi. Daniel Pemberton uh, from the Spider-Verse for Filoni's New Republic era movie in Hildur Gunadotter. Uh, I looked it up and uh, that is uh, what my English tongue can manage. Apologies uh, for any uh, incorrectness there. Uh, uh, Hildur Gunadotter, whose Joker is one of her credits that Chris Lamb lists. Uh, for the new Jedi Order. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is really fun. I am not as big of a, I, I don't know what the term, score head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Score monster. Uh, I, I'm not as big of an aficionado of this side of filmmaking, but I do have some thoughts and, and opinions. Where do you go with this, Ken? Uh, yeah, it's, I've, I've said this before, but just in terms of composers or music, I, I love it. I love it when I know it. I love, you know, I love my Williams. I love... Uh, uh, James Horner, the late James Horner, all this stuff. But yeah, I, my, my my pal and our our pal friend of the show, Mark Riley, he's a composer head. If that's what it is, <laughs> where you could just be like, uh, well, what about the asteroid chase? And he'll just start humming pitch perfect, uh, you know, renditions of the music there. Where my other friend Josh was like, there was music in that movie. Uh, so I'm, <laughs> I'm somewhere in the middle where I'm very aware, I'm moved by it, but I learn more of it later on. So. Um, this is a great question. We, we get it from time to time and I, I love to update the answer. So I don't know a lot of names, um, but I think I'll start here. Go, uh, I think back in 2015 or so um, before even maybe an after force awakens came out, we were heading towards uh, rogue one, which Desplat was going to be the composer at first. Right. And, <laughs> and then uh, Giacchino took over. I, I would have wanted one composer to lead the way. And Ramin mm-hmm. Jawadi would have been my choice because of my, my love of Game of Thrones. And, and that was uh, kind of during the peak period of it right then. So that would have been my answer. But that was before uh, we got to experience other music that wasn't John Williams, which John's. And well, I always want to make sure 
Kevin Kiner, Kiner music was out there already. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't as celebrated, wasn't as known, wasn't as talked about. Um, we, it would have been much worse. But, but, this was, but before, you know, Disney Plus and, and just the ability to, to hear other people's interpretations of Star Wars music before, uh, 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 you know, Mandalorian and everything. Uh, so that's changed. And I love the idea of passing the baton around. Uh, you got the Kiner, uh, Kevin Kiner and the, and, and, uh, the Kiner brothers doing Ahsoka. I, mm -hmm. I love Natalie Holt's work in Kenobi. I will stand by it. And nope, I do not need any themes from uh, the original trilogy until the end because that was part of the creative decision. I loved it. John Powell solo. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. So many shows and projects. Uh, I'll say this. I've kind of got Joseph. I got a little bit of the Filoni bleep eating grin that he gets on his face when he knows something that you don't i've heard strong rumors about a uh, skeleton cruise composer it's a, it's a um i'll say new but familiar name i think uh is the way to phrase it to star wars uh and can you I, wear a t-shirt that hints at it i'm gonna i'm gonna it's, it's now gone from question mark to uh exclamation point on my t-shirt Ooh. Uh, <laughs> And I'm excited about the possibility of bringing in new names because that's what this era is all about as well. New names, new perspectives, new approaches from people who have spent lifetimes loving Star Wars like us. I really, really agree with that. Uh, Chris's qu question is, is great. Uh, his picks are great, but I really agree strongly with uh, his perspective and yours that this is the time to have some variety. Uh, and I think that is what's happening across the Disney Plus shows. Uh, Ludwig Gordonson with with The Mandalorian, it sounded really, really different at first, oh, uh, yeah. that first episode. Um, and I, I liked it from the get-go, I think, because I'd been paying more attention to Clone Wars mm -hmm. and, and how much Kevin Kiner, mm -hmm. it, with Filoni and Lucas's encouragement, experimented and stretched the bounds mm -hmm. and uh, as, as Star Wars would veer toward let's this episode does really lean into this different genre and how to match that mm. with, in the music um, that I always liked Ludwig Gorenson's score. And when the first season became very popular, I think that score became uh, mm -hmm. iconic pretty quickly, but what's been fascinating to me about it is as it's grown and it is still Ludwig Gorenson's themes, uh, Joseph Shirley is the main composer for the, the third season, but it's, it started out stripped down in, in you know, mm -hmm. uh, th this fun, different, almost, you know, frontier, outer rim vibe. But mm -hmm. those themes are getting so big now. Yeah. So orchestral that it's built as, as uh, Din goes out in the galaxy and meets more people and the stakes become higher for him that the music is matching. And now what we thought of as Ludwig Gornson's very, very different take on Star Wars music is growing to feel like it can sit right next to William's themes to me. So mm -hmm. I think even though it's things can be very different, they can also be sort of aligned in, in scale once you get up to the big majestic moments. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, that, that, that um, you know, the amount of hours on podcasts and YouTube shows going into Mandalorian of what will the music be like? And then within one episode, it felt like it was always there in your heart and soul, which is part of the, the genius of, of Gornson's work, I think, and, and, and part of the, the fun of, of finding new, new voices and new thoughts and new, new talent to work on this stuff. Yeah. It's hard, it's hard to let go, but hey, look, and John Williams is still going strong. He's got a, a big series of concerts coming up. Hollywood Bowl on uh, July 7th, 8th, and 9th is, is huge. Um, so I think that's part of it too, where we're so lucky to still have them. You just kind of want to keep them going, but that's not necessarily the right attitude either. Yeah. You know, but yeah, we, I, if, if there's something that he wants to do, I really like that he's been doing like, Hey, you, mm -hmm. I see uh, you, you doing a show with Benny. <laughs> with <Obi -Wan> Kenobi. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to do that. Yeah. I'd like to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it is hard to let go. I also think that there's, um, uh, something that I really like about the announcement of these th three films, we'll, we'll see uh, everything is in chaos right now, uh, honestly, in Hollywood with the WGA and yep, yep. the DGA and SAG both in talks uh, that, you know, there might be a slowdown on these, on these movies. We don't know when they'll come out, but the way that they were presented at Star Wars Celebration, I really like that they're all big stories with big scopes and potentially galactic scales. Kathleen Kennedy talking about bringing the crawls back. Mm -hmm. I think that they're, the films are aligned in terms of when you go to the movie theater for Star Wars, it's going to be a big, 
bold, sweeping story. Mm. Uh, and they're spread out by timeline, but they're connected by this vision of big, bold, sweeping. And so there is that legacy of Williams in the way the films are being described to us. So mm. I would love it if all three of the scores, all three of the composers are swinging for the scale, the scope, the wonder, the majesty, the 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 heart of Williams, but doing it in entirely different ways and doing it in their own styles that match the films. Mm. Yeah. You get me excited. The crawls, the big sounds, Star Wars in yeah. the theater. The yeah, music's come on. Uh, yeah. Keeping, mm -hmm. keeping uh, things crossed for these movies mm -hmm. happening sooner rather than later. With that in mind, we got a lot of fun time to talk about them. So let's dive into our personal picks for scoring. Uh, do you want to go first? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, well, but it's a remix. I'm just, I'm just going to say rum and Jawadi for a movie. I think it's perfect <laughs> for Don Jedi, but, but I, I obviously love his work. And he's got a lot of work beyond Game of Thrones, by the way. But I, I said this before, when you see him in concert, the, the, the dude's a rock star. Uh, literally at one point coming out with electric guitar for one of his things, but you really feel the theme work in the music. It really mm -hmm. starts to emerge when you strip away the show and you're just there with other fans enjoying it and you see, and, and you, oh, that's the Starks and you hear why it's the Starks. Oh, that's the Lannisters and you hear why it's the Lannisters. That, 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 it really works. It works on a level that I think is even not fully appreciated uh, until you get a chance to experience that. Um, um, so, I've always thought, and, and and that was one of the things with, 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 with Dan and Dave preparing to go into Star Wars, it seemed just natural to me, much like Filoni pulling Kiner onto Ahsoka, just seemed natural that they pull Jawadi into Star Wars. So I still hope to see it one day. That's one of the biggest ones for me. Um, I would love, again, I told you to remix it. I would love John Powell to get another shot. Mm. Along with so many things about Solo that were overlooked and underappreciated, the music. Uh, and, and look, there's pockets of uh, people you can go on even online right now. Hashtag makes a little too happen. Look at that. You'll find people just absolutely moved and celebrating the music. Some of my favorite Star Wars pieces are his uh, in solo. So having him get it uh, would be work for me. And then, uh, yeah, Kiner, Kiner uh, in a theater. Um, again, because, of course, the Clone Wars movie was there. Uh, Kiner in a theater would be something special. I think the appreciation of things, it, 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 the experimentation angle was always there from the beginning, but I think the appreciation of it as his music matched the moments, the big moments later on that moved so many of us, Ahsoka leaving, uh, Kane and Jairus' death, uh, that, that, that season seven, which was epic and theatrical in its own mm -hmm. way. It all, that it just was kind of like, oh, you can't ignore this anymore. So put him there. No. I really, I really uh, agree with these picks. I like these picks. Uh, some of mine are going to be similar, <laughs> uh, but I, I wanted to assign them to specific movies. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin Kiner is is the first thing um, people talk about. The first Star Wars movie in the theater that isn't John Williams that was two thousand eight Clone mm -hmm. Wars. Kevin Kiner and uh, clearly encouraged to swing for the fences that. Uh, weird at the time, rare rock beat uh, mm -hmm. for the the crawl up to the monastery on Teth. Um, wasn't sure about it at the time. In retrospect, I love it. It's what Star Wars needs. Mm -hmm. um, all sorts of uh, fun experiments uh, throughout Clone Wars and Rebels, as well as that absolutely heartfelt stuff is one of uh, my bigger cheers in mm -hmm. the Star Wars celebration, you know, getting lucky enough to be in the room is the revelation that Kevin Kiner was doing at Ahsoka. I think Kevin Kiner should absolutely do the Floney's mm -hmm. New Republic film. Yeah. I think that he should be seen, celebrated, all those great things. Mm -hmm. uh, I I didn't find a spot for John Powell on my list, <laughs> but I agree with you. Uh, Solo is one of the most listened to soundtracks. I have the expanded soundtracks or even parts of it that were like, hey, I, I want to hear the rest of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but then for Dawn of the Jedi, uh, Ramin Jawadi, I think is a great pick. Um, but I was also trying to go through my mind of like, what, oh, I feel like recently there've been a few things I've watched where I've been affected by the music. Mm, mm -hmm. uh, and I watched both seasons of the television show of the white Lotus. Um, mm. And I think it's the kind of thing that might even be too much for some people, but his, his, his actual themes to the, the show, the actual opening of the show this is one of those weird shows that actually has an opening, opening yeah. credits, Remember with, that. Uh, pictures and music and actors names. Mm -hmm. What? 
Um, uh, those are popular. Um, he, he's done a bunch of other stuff, but particularly in the first season, there was a couple of these great moments where a character has been driven to the absolute breaking point and they are marching to deal with something. And in the story on the surface, it's a hotel manager having this interpersonal little fight with one of the guests. So it feels like small stakes, but the music goes huge. It goes wild and it makes you feel the truth of from the outside. It's a hotel manager fighting with a hotel guest, but in their souls, it's everything. It's their mm-hmm. existence. It's their done being demeaned. This is the battle for their soul. And the music is telling you that in this almost over the top way. And I really enjoyed that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and all that music was done uh, by a composer named uh, Cristobal Tapia de Vier. Uh, so I would love that for uh, Dawn of the Jedi. Love that. Uh, that's a, that's a great, that's a, that's a wild card pick. I'd say. Yeah, I wanted to go wild card. And uh, my final is not wild at all. It's uh, it's pretty straight across the plate. That The baseball thing, uh, uh, I don't know the terms. But for the new Jedi Order, I want Natalie Holt. Um, I absolutely. Uh, that was one of the times that I just really stood up, even though I'm not a composer head or a score head, <laughs> and noticed the music was on the first season of Loki, which Natalie Holt did. Weird, haunting, beautiful, quirky, funny all these things that so match the show. So I was mm. thrilled when she was announced for, announced for Kenobi. And I think she just uh, absolutely knocked it out of the, uh, the park. The, the Mapuzo theme in mm-hmm. particular is one of my favorites. Every bit of music for the Inquisitors and for Riva, for the heartbreak mm-hmm. of, of Kenobi. And yeah, finally building into uh, themes from the Skywalker mm-hmm. saga, but really holding back and building new things man I, that's that's so great for something like the new jedi order that is about uh mm-hmm. these mm-hmm. new beginnings with ties to the past uh, i love that that's that's what that's a great point of how that could work and how that could play out yeah any other thoughts on this question ken i no. i apologize uh you know for my lack of of rolodex of composers in my heart and soul a lot of you out there have uh other choices i'm sure we'd love to hear about them in fact this gets discussed often in our discord via our patreon page we have a star wars music section section and there's just a lot of wonderful names thrown in there all the time yeah so i look forward to uh to reading uh some and <laughs> learning some more names <laughs> yeah yeah all right we are gonna wrap up with a power of the light side uh, we had a question earlier uh, from Antonio. Uh, we also have a Power of the Light Side segment uh, entry from Antonio Mendiola. And here's what Antonio has to say. I hope this isn't too terribly long. Apologies in advance. I know Ken and Joseph don't necessarily require accolades when asking for submissions for this segment. Uh, we don't. But too bad, says Antonio. Uh, you guys, along with Jennifer Landa, have been my go-to and really only Star Wars podcast for nearly three years running now. Cannot thank you three enough for your positive outlook on our beloved saga. Force Center is a podcast that genuinely makes me feel safe, seen, and often understood when I feel like I may be the only one feeling the way I'm feeling. I was first aware of Ken from his previous work on Jedi Council. Hearing his takes on Star Wars eventually led me to the Force Center feed on Spotify right around the time of the Rise of Skywalker coming out. Joseph quickly became another one of my favorite Star Wars pundits, and I was looking forward to the big Force Center discussion on the Rise of Skywalker just as much as I was looking forward to the film itself. I found your few Star Wars film commentaries on YouTube and saw Jennifer's enthusiasm and humor. And I had a new favorite trio of folks to listen to yap about my favorite thing ever. I grew up with the prequels as they were coming out. My first Star Wars movie was the VHS copy of The Phantom Menace thanks to my mom. Must have watched that thing nearly every day for a long time. Soon after, I was bought the special edition box set of the original trilogy. I remember the day I was going to see Attack of the Clones, and I have vivid memories of going to see Revenge of the Sith at midnight with my dad at the mere age of eight. Mm. Obviously, we all deal with the harsh discourse going around in our fandom, but it really gets to me at times, and I get very upset at some of the takes out there. I actually at one point let YouTube videos and people on social media convince me that the prequels were bad. I was in that mindset for about three years. It wasn't until The Force Awakens was coming out that I realized that those opinions were not mine. I love and always have loved the prequels. I was done letting other influential people tell me what my opinions on Star Wars should be. Fast forward to 2019, The Rise of Skywalker premieres, and I immediately knew it was my personal favorite of the sequel trilogy. And believe me, I absolutely loved The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi, so I was happy to hear 
that my four center friends loved the film as well. The Rise of Skywalker will always be special to me because it's the first Star Wars movie I took my mom to see in theaters. She showed me the beginning of the Skywalker saga, and I got to take her to the end of it. Although she had already read most of the spoilers and details because she doesn't like surprises. <laughs> and I'm sure she thought the film was just all right, which is fair enough. Uh, I think I've babbled on enough, says Antonio. Uh, just one more sincere thank you to you two and Jennifer for being there for me when I need positive Star Wars discussion to listen to. As long as the Force wills it, please never stop. You are absolutely making a difference in your listeners' lives, and I hope I speak for all Force Center fans when I say we are eternally grateful for your contribution to this, at times, complicated fandom. Next big Star Wars stop for me, tickets to see Return of the Jedi, my favorite Star Wars film, on May 3rd for its 40th anniversary Take care, you three, and may the force be with you all. Thank you, Antonio. These are very, very kind words uh, about our podcast. And great to hear uh, this very specific journey through Star Wars, through the ups and downs of the discourse, and through the connection it makes to family. Ken, what are your thoughts? Uh, for, look, accolades are needed, but uh, they help. And hey, they help not because it bumps you up the list like a, you're tipping the karaoke guy at the bar to get your song first, <laughs> uh, because uh, we feel what you all feel as well. We talk often about the community here and the community that's uh, around our show. And it's truly, it's just natural. Our, our, our names are on the marquee, so to speak, but, but it'd be an empty theater if not for you all. Uh, but we go through this too, where it, 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 what I've discovered too, it's, it's, it's less and less the hot takes and all that kind of stuff. It's, I don't know. It's just the vibe and the feeling and the energy behind people. So um, focused on, on, on what they think of it and not accounting for what others think of it does not mean I need everyone to love everything that much like, yeah, your mom says Red Skywalker is all right. It's all right. That's her answer. Um, but it's when that goes out of balance and that becomes a hammer to swing on the top of someone else's head who loves the movie. It's, it's where that's where I think we're all getting a little down. Right. And mm -hmm. just the tone and tenor discussion. So it affects us too daily, daily. Um, and I'm afraid to talk about Star Wars sometimes. Uh, I was just at a, a way for a wedding weekend. The amount of people came up to me and said, "Hey, I saw, I, Mark said you you like Star Wars. I like Star Wars too." And then that 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 either goes good or it goes bad. <laughs> and um, you know, and and so the, the it, 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 it we we receive the energy that you maybe you're getting from us and the love of Star Wars you're getting from us. We receive it from you all as well. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think when I have conversations uh, with people who I'm just meeting or have been in my life before I started doing Four Center and I'm talking to them uh, about Four Center, it's often all of your stories that I say, like, uh, I really like yeah. Star Wars and it is very meaningful to me and I get depth out of it. We love talking about, you know, what is our favorite lightsaber and what's the coolest fight and why and all, all those kind of things. But I always tell people, but it's the depth. Star Wars helps people. And it's your stories that I share. I leave names out in case I don't have permission. Uh, but I tell people all these memories about uh, family and childhood and how it help, uh, helps people through all the challenging parts of life and brings joy and connection. Mm -hmm. And and we, we just treasure hearing that from all of you, which is part of the reason we do the Power of the Light Side segment to sort of push back on uh, those interactions uh, that, you know, it's really gotten to me uh, mm -hmm. for me, Ken, of when you, you don't know what situation you're in and you get the, oh, you like Star Wars or oh, you got a Star Wars podcast and you're just waiting. You're waiting. You're waiting. And I think it's for me. It's like, OK, we've both agreed that we like this thing. Now mm -hmm. is the first thing you're going to say the part you don't like <laughs> the yeah. part that you're angry about. Because could we just pump the brakes on that and talk about, you know, something mm -hmm. hey, job of aquarium. We all love that. Right. Let's yeah. talk about that first, and then maybe we can get into. You, know, you didn't like the special yeah. effects in Kenobi, yeah, 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 uh, yeah. yeah. And I and I think that's that's a thing for me is I I I got to be vigilant about that. I I I have little things for myself for Kenobi that I would you know mm -hmm. question or pick at, but in the great big scheme of things, it's beautiful. And, and when I sat down to rewatch it, is one thing, and like. I remember watching uh, the speeder that it's not a snow speeder because it's just a speeder, yeah. but the speeder and the special effects like that, yeah, like that doesn't that doesn't look great, mm -hmm. uh, and and feeling like the, the house of cards tumbling down because I know everybody's gonna be mad about it, 
And then when I sat down to watch Kenobi in one go and just treasure it, and it's half a second of, yeah. you know, not 100%, maybe 92% good special effects. And like, yeah. this is what we care about? That's what I let yeah. pollute me? Mm-hmm. It's so mm-hmm. weird yeah. that we're all so vulnerable to that. Yeah, no, which is why we need the energy of the others around us. And and, and part of the part of the yeah. power of the lights, I think, and talking about the personal stories, sharing it. Uh, um, I think it's a it, 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 you know when someone comes forward with this kind of story, it it, it connects with other listeners. who are like, oh, I went through that too. I took my mom to see this, or I have that memory, or yeah, I a VHS copy of Phantom Menace, my first one too, and I, I think that helps build the connections. That's why we do this as well. Absolutely. So, yeah, thank you for the very kind words, uh, Antonio. Thank you for uh, the the knowledge that, that we all go through. Some of those ups and downs. I remember my VHS copy of The Phantom Menace. Uh, I was so excited. Uh, I rewatched it in my brother's apartment's party room with a bunch of uh, mm-hmm. nerds. <laughs> and excited to revisit it. And, you know, uh, my dad's so excited for Dial of Destiny. He's an Indiana Jones guy, mm. and I can't wait. I'm hopefully going to be able to uh, see it with him later in the summer. Uh, and that's going to be, I haven't seen a movie with my dad. And mm, I'm not even going to say how many years, decades, <laughs> decades. And I'm so looking forward to that experience. Thank you uh, so much for these great thoughts, Antonio. Love it. Love it all. Love it. All right, Ken, where can people find us? Hey, if you want to be part of this community, well, you can find us on Twitter at four center pod. We're on Instagram and YouTube as well. See you for that live Q and a on Saturday. First Facebook page is four center podcast. We are available on a lot of different spots. Spotify is one of them. Stitcher, TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, and more. Just search. You'll find us. Merch available at tpublic.com slash user slash Force Center. And patreon.com slash Force Center is where you can support us directly, If we, as we said. You can follow me at Cadnapsock. Go to my website, cadnapsock.com, for more information on the things I do, which are right now a little less because I'm concentrating on a, a, a new gig right now. But don't worry. More things on my YouTube channel and other podcasts coming your way soon. Joseph, where can they find them? follow you yeah you can find me on all the social media is at joseph scrimshaw i'm on twitter i'm on instagram mastodon tiktok uh i am still promoting the kickstarter for the short film i'm working on the film is called the nightmare adorable thank you to everyone who has uh, supported it who has uh backed it and shared social media posts about it if you're interested in checking out what it's all about you can just search for joseph scrimshaw on kickstarter.com but for now for myself for ken for Gideon's mustache wherever it ended up this has been Cues of the Force Force